This is Hannibal here from the HannibalTV.com. And today as a guest, I have Dr. D. David Schultz, former WWE superstar bounty hunter, the man that slapped John Stossel in his ear. He was recently the star of Dark Side of the Ring. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Been a while since I talked to you. Yes, there, there's actually a part one to this. Anyone watching this that wants to search it up, it had great feedback. Uh, how have you been doing since then? I've been doing great, man. I'm just, you know, out doing appearances, uh, trying to stay busy, still out on the road, driving the big rigs uh, part-time. And, uh, you know, once you become a truck driver to make a living, I mean, I've always drove them ever since I was in the Army. But after wrestling, I had to make money, and that's what I went back to. And then I got into the bounty hunting, and uh, it's been good, and I'm still doing a little of that. I'm starting to get a little bit slow, though, on the bounty hunting stuff. <laughs> I got I can't make a decision what to do. You know, I don't know if I want to go here or do that or do that, you know, because you don't give them one choice, and it could be the worst choice you ever made. And you also won a Cauliflower Alley Club Award a couple of years ago. I think that was the last time I saw you. What did That's that right. mean? Well, it was it was great that, uh, you know, they wanted to give me an award. I asked Brian Blair, I said, why did you wait 40 years to do it? And I, I don't know. You know, they didn't have an answer. I said, I wrestled 40 years. Nobody ever called me a wrestler. And then you give me a, an award for being – a wrestler, the wrestler of the year, and all that, you know. And, you know, I put it with the rest of the awards uh, for my grandkids or whatever they want to do with it. You know, I don't, uh, I, awards, uh, they're okay, but uh, I got a pile of them, uh, different things, and um, DEA, ATF, all this, FBI, just, I got all kind of letters and documents, but people's not interested in that. They would be interested if they followed me up in New York City and dragged one of those scumbags out of them buildings. And <laughs> they have a whole different view of it. That's true. And I remember your speech from that night. You kind of called out Stone Cold Steve Austin. What was behind that that call out, why you brought him up in your acceptance? Well, <clears throat> you know, I brought everything to the Call for Alley Club because uh, Jerry Lawler and Steve Austin did a podcast, and of course, Jerry Lawler, uh, we were partners for a long time, and I've known him ever since I've been in the business, and he said, he told Steve Austin, you know, he cuffed that guy right in the ear with his hand, cuffed him uh, in the ear. So Steve Austin jumps up and says, yep, he cuffed him right here. I don't believe that he cuffed that guy in the ear. And this Everybody knows me. I don't need to cuff nobody in the ear to knock them off their feet. I guarantee you, you know, I don't even get near there. So I brought a part of John Stossel's deposition to the Cauliflower Alley Club and Jerry Lawler's out there. And, you know, I asked him, uh, you know, you said I had to cuff the guy's ear. Well, I got a copy of the deposition right here where John Stossel said, I never touched his ears. And you ought to watch the tape more good than trying to make a name off of me. And knocking me, he oh I didn't do it. Yes, you did. You did, and you need to face up to it. And then I asked him how many times I saved his life, and you know, uh, spectator stuff, pulling guns on him, and I'd come up behind him, take the gun away, and give him a little tap, throw the gun out in the woods, and we take off. But different times, I've uh, actually saved his life because he don't like to fight. I don't know why, but he. He don't like fighting. He act like he does, but he don't. Steve Austin, I, uh, somebody called him and told him that I was mad at him uh, at the Colorado Alley Club. And you know how people talk, especially the uh, wrestlers and entertainers or whatever. They want to talk about anything they can. So I guess they said that I called Steve Austin out. Well, I did. I asked, was he there? And, of course, he wasn't there. So the time I got home, he called me. My wife said, I bet he called you 15 times, David. Will you call him back? 
So I waited a couple of days, three days, called him back. Hey, Steve, how you doing? Hey, Doc, what's up? Blah, 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 blah. And he said, I heard uh, you were upset with me or we had a problem. I said, yeah, we got a problem. You're running your mouth telling people that, you know, I had to cut this little squirt to, to knock him off his feet. John Stossel, I think that was his name. And Steve, you know, and I know that I don't need to cuff nobody's ear to knock them off their feet. And I don't appreciate you saying that. He said, no, I'm sorry. It was Jerry Lawler. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait a minute now. Stand up. Be a man. And answer what I'm telling you. You said that. Jerry Lawler also. Don't put it on Jerry, though. Jerry didn't twist your arm to say, oh, yeah, he cuffed him right in the ear. You should have spoke up and said, well, it looked like it was a clean slap to me, but you didn't do that. But anyway, he said, well, what can we do? We can't do nothing. It's all square, man. We're square. Don't worry about it. Just don't say it again. If you say it again, I will come and see you personally, face to face. And I don't want to do that, Steve. I figured we was okay with uh, everything, but uh, I don't like people talking about me or making, making, uh, getting them some heat by talking about me or make them act like they're smarter than they really are by talking about me. I'm the least person you need to talk about because I really don't care what you say about me. But when it something like this that was on national TV and you say I got to cuff his ear, come on, give me a break, man. Uh, you know, but he, I had the deposition when John Stossel said, they asked him, did he hit you in the ear? John Stossel said, no. He hit me on both cheeks. Now they take a break in the deposition. The lawyers want a break to talk about everything John Stossel's saying. And they come back after the break, and the lawyer said, now, didn't he hit you in the ears? And John said, uh, what, did his hand touch your ear, any part of his hand? Well, his fingertips might have touched my ears. Come on. This guy is a coward. He's a punk. He couldn't even take his wife out to eat and protect her. I wonder how he faces her every day, knowing that he's such a coward. And that's what he is, John Stossel. My opinion of you, you are a piece of garbage, just like Vince McMahon. You and him ought to be in bed together or something. And you ought to be able to protect your wife. Every man ought to be able to protect their wife. And you're not that category, man. All you can do is run your mouth and hide. And, that, you know, on the dark side of the ring, I was supposed to have a meeting with him and discuss this. Well, he refused to show up. So I told him they could handcuff me and cut my legs together and put me on a two-wheeler <laughs> and roll me out there and then let me break out of the two-wheeler. You want to see him run? Ooh, that'd be funny. But uh, it didn't happen. He didn't want nowhere near me, but he had a few words for me at the end of the show, like, F you, David Schultz. Oh, man, come on. Can't you get a little more original than that? <laughs> what did you think about how the producers put that whole documentary together? Did you approve of the final product that they put out? No, I didn't get to approve it. I was supposed to get to approve it, but you know, when they put the final product out, they leave you out. They, you know, they did an okay job because the people that seen it when it was showed on TV, they didn't see all the stuff that was on the cutting room floor. Now, I guess the big wigs up in Montreal, who wherever it is, have a different idea of entertainment or anything but professional wrestling, and they want they don't want too much violence in it or too much. Of, but with what they had, they did a pretty good job. I mean, I I, I wasn't overly happy they were supposed to, you know. Um, put my book on there, uh, give me publicity on the book three different times during the show. Well, I think Jim Cornette, that little mouth, he uh, he run his mouth on it, and he did pretty good on running his mouth about the book. But, you know, I tried to get in touch with him four or five times. He didn't want to talk to me. People don't want to talk to me. Well, they don't have to worry about it. I throw their number away, so I don't have to ever worry about it. But, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, has never been told, and they didn't want to push anything like uh why i got fired 
why I lost my job, why Vince McMahon don't want me there anymore. And I was such a great guy at first. But that's the way the TV business is, I guess. It's the way their business is. But I was told that I would have the final say on everything. And I didn't get the final say. I was told that I would be able to, if I didn't want somebody on there, they wouldn't be on there. Well, there's a lot of people I didn't want on there. Uh, but they went ahead and put them on there anyway. But that's just that's just with television. I think you've been around television long enough to know that yes means no and no means yes. <laughs> that's why people in Poland, I worked in Poland, you know, three years, Sikorsky Aircraft on helicopters. And after about a year and a half, one of the Polish guys come up and I asked him, I said, why are they still doing what I told them not to do? He said, because you're telling them, nah, nah, nah is yes in Polish. And you have to say, no, not no. <laughs> Down south, we say, no, no. Well, he thought I'd say, yes, yes. And they went ahead and done it anyway. <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny, except they run into millions of dollars and, uh, had to get it straightened out quick. There's a fan on here wondering if you think WWE will ever put you in their Hall of Fame. You've become such a, a legend, and that slapping thing happened decades ago. Do you think they'll ever drop the grudge and put you in the Hall of Fame? And if they invited you, would you say yes? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, would, I would guess I would. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think I would, but it'll never happen, see, because Vince McMahon cannot use my name, my picture, or my likeness ever as long as he's got left on this earth. That was in uh, one of the lawsuits that we had, that he can't print my picture, he can't show my videos, he can't use my name, and I guess they just don't want to use my name for that reason. And of course, Vince don't want me nowhere near him. I'm... I'm positive of that and uh you know it's just you know it's a shame that a man that has so many championship matches with world title holders been the main event in most of the big arenas around the united states japan and different different areas that they wouldn't even consider him for hall of fame but yet They'll put people in there that's never actually took a bump or don't know nothing about wrestling. They just put them in there. And there's a couple of little uh, people. I mean, I don't even want to be next to them. I don't want, I don't want to be associated with them. And they put them in the Hall of Fame. Uh, most of the guys deserve being there. They got a bunch of uh, good guys in there, and it's, it's, it's good. But some of them don't need to be don't need to be mentioned around a wrestling uh, name, arena, uh, anywhere or anything. But that's my opinion, too. Were you in the WWE when Jimmy Snuka had his little incident where the woman passed away? Because he's another guy that's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I don't think I was. And uh, what was that now? One more time. You know, when Jimmy Snuka allegedly, I guess he was found civilly guilty of killing his girlfriend. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. You, were you still in uh, working for Vince at that time when that happened? I believe I was. I know Vince had to get him out of a lot of trouble. And I knew Nancy, the girl he uh, killed. And, uh, you know, actually we was not friends, but we was acquaintances. I knew her. And, uh, you know, and I've tried to find out, you know, they're going to cover everything up. You can't get nobody to even talk about in the dressing room the night I slapped Stossel. All the guys heard Vince over there tell me to go out and tear his ass up, blast him, stay in character. And anybody that ever watches any kind of TV knows that you don't walk out and do an interview, especially Madison Square Gardens, without it all being set up to go. I just walk out of the dress room and say, hey, let's do an interview here. And uh, nobody knows how many times Stossel walked up there to interview me. He was so nervous he couldn't do the interview. 
uh, two or three times. I forget how many it was. It was you know, he couldn't even talk. And uh, then after he said what he said, he thought, I thought, I thought at that time, at that second, he said, I think you're fake. But evidently he said, I think it's fake. Well, I wanted to show him it went fake, and that's why, that's all I did, show him it went fake. Now, uh, you know, if he can't stand up on his feet, that's his problem, not mine. Uh, you know, he's not fast enough to get away from me, that's for sure. So, you know, I was always taught, you knock know, a man down, if he stays down, leave him alone. But if he gets up, knock him back down, because he might come back and cause you harm. I doubt it, but you know, <laughs> that's what that's the way I was taught. And I just wanted to be sure that he wasn't going to cause me some harm. And that's my opinion, too, you know. What do you think about how the business is today that there's no more kayfabe and the WWE itself even admits that it's fake and you have wrestlers after they wrestle each other publicly thanking them? themselves for the matches on social media and stuff like this? I think it's pathetic uh, as far as professional wrestling. Uh, you know, uh, we go back for years and years and years. And how many guys have been hurt really bad, uh, even lost their lives in different instances in professional wrestling? And now they're trying to, trying to get it. Just It's the big money, the big bucks. They do anything that their bosses tell them to do and they have to do it one thing most of the guys don't have enough sense to do an interview or talk about real things because uh, they, they've always been told you do it this way word for word if you don't you're out of here and you know uh they're making great money and that's wonderful i'm glad they are and uh but i'm not gonna sell my soul to anybody for anything I mean, I get up every day and I look in the mirror and I am happy. I am happy. The way I look, I've still got a, a bunch of hair. I mean, I just wear the hat to keep the light out of my eyes, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm jealous of your hair, actually. Yeah. Well, I caught it on fire here uh, a couple months ago, a light in a wood stove, and I had a piece of the. Uh, uh, the lighter wood on top and I had another piece of the lighter wood and I bent down and forgot I had the one on the left and it caught my hair on fire. I had burned it. I burned my beard down. I had to cut my beard. I had to start all over trimming it and everything. But man, it goes up quick. There's a fan on here that wants to know uh, what are your thoughts on Mr. Wonderful passing away? That's one of the guys you worked with in your career. Paul Orton. Yeah, well, as a, you know, anytime, anytime anybody passes away, that's a bad situation, but it's something that we all have to do. That's what we're, we're born and we're going to die. Uh, Paul was a good guy to me. We had a good time together, and he was a good guy, and he was a tough guy. People know how tough he was, but he was tough, and, and he didn't take too much off of anybody. He would stand up to them. And I love people like that that stands up to people. It don't have to be any physical contact. Just stand up to them. Let them know what the facts are, what's going on, and instead of tucking your head and running to hide somewhere. But Paul was a good guy like that. Someone would like to know who would you consider the toughest guy out of the wrestlers in the locker room? You were always known as one of the toughest. Is there anyone else you would put in that category? Not, not during my time, but today, the way I look at them, they got a few guys in there are pretty darn tough. If they went and held back, they're held back because uh, entertainment, but they are a few that's pretty tough. And uh, I wouldn't really mind. Well, no, I can't do that because I'm getting too old, I guess. But uh, in my day, I would have loved to uh, be matched up with a few of them and see how tough they really are. But you know, they got some. They got some tough guys in there. You're a tough guy, Hannibal. I've seen you in action. People don't know. I know you're a tough guy, and you take care of yourself. 
And well, that's the reason I like you. You're a stand-up guy. And people don't know that, see. I know that. I'm an investigator. I investigated, you see. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's another fan on here that says he read your book, but you didn't talk very much about the Portland Territory in your book. Uh, could you elaborate on any stories of your time in Portland? Well, Portland, uh, Don Owens and Elton Owens, they run that territory. They called me. I, I went up there, and they had some uh, pretty good plans for me. And after about a month or two, uh, I believe it was Don who went called me in and, and said, you two rub on these guys. You're a big guy. I didn't know you was that big a guy. And Ricky Rocky Johnson was up there. We had, but most of the guys were short little guys. And then Buddy Rose, he was supposed to be a superhero. When I met him, I asked him, I said, you're Buddy Rose? And he said, yeah, Doc, we're going to have some good matches together. I don't know about that. But you, you know, you, you're not big at all. But, you know, you're, you've been here a long time. People think you're tough, so we'll see. And we had some good matches together. But, you know, if you're a big guy in Portland back those days, they didn't. Don Owen told me, we didn't mean to bring you in here. Didn't know you that big. <laughs> and as far as Canada, where I'm from, you were wrestling in the Maritimes and Calgary, where you were over in both places. Did you like one of the two territories better? No, I love Calgary. Calgary was uh, the greatest territory I ever worked. I mean, it was great. The Stu Hart was great. Most of the Hart boys were great. Some of them I had a little problem with, but uh, it didn't take long to straighten that out. But uh, I know Bret Hart, we had a bunch of knockdown drag outs, and he, he, he could take care of himself in the ring, and people didn't realize that uh, he could take care of himself that good. I, I told him, I said, hey, this boy done been put through all that stuff y'all talking about. His daddy done tied him up and tied him in knots. And <laughs> they didn't realize that, you know. But Brett was a, a tough guy. He could take care of himself. And what, what I'm saying is these guys would misunderstand him. He's a good, nice talking guy, friendly guy. But if he gets you in the ring, he might just uh, put your head where you don't want it. Then he can do it. How did you find uh, the booking of that territory? Did, uh, did you like the way that Stu booked the matches, or was it one of the boys booking at the time you were there? I didn't know who was booking, really. I never... Well, now I knew it was one of the boys, one of the hearts, and then another one of the hearts, and then I think it was Stu, and then I didn't, I didn't know if Stu was calling the shots or not, because Stu was more like my type of guy, a tough guy, you know, he, he, he loved tough people and uh, people that could take care of themselves. Stu Hart loved them, you know, and but some of the Hart boys would uh, be booking, they said. And they would book matches at, uh, I don't know what, why or how, excuse me, had a hiccup there. I, did, I don't know why or how they would book these matches, but they bring people in from, uh, like Dynamite Kid, when he come in, Davey Boy Smith, you know, they didn't weigh 175 pounds. And then all of a sudden, he, he, he's a monster, you know. But me and Dynamite had some super, super matches, and, you know, most of the time in the matches in Calgary, we kind of made up our own way to go. They would give us a general idea on the entertainment prospect of it, but we would change it if we wanted to or we felt like we needed to. You know, it's all what the fans are wanting. You know, sometimes you get out there and the fans, you've got to do other things to get the fans to that point where they hate you. Well, I don't have no problem with that. <laughs> But, you know, it seems like I, 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 love, I was there three years in Calgary. Uh, I loved it there, you know. And it's Tony Atlas's birthday today, and there's a fan on here that wants to know your thoughts on Tony Atlas. Tony Atlas. Well, Tony, Tony was uh, okay. Uh, Rocky Johnson, Tony Atlas, uh, wrestled together in uh, tag team. Tony would get mad at me because of the interviews I would do about his 
father and his grandfather and all that. And Rocky Johnson would not get mad. Rocky Johnson said, that's good, David. That's good. It makes it easy, man. We're, we're making money and, and we're doing our job. But Tony did not want me talking about his grandfather and his father and all that. So I said, okay, Tony, I'll talk about you then. And uh, he didn't like that either. But we always got along. I mean, we didn't have no uh, problem. But he did not like the way I did my interviews. And, of course, you couldn't do the interviews I did back then today. Uh, Lord, have mercy. Uh, 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 uh. No, he you get in some trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As soon as you open your mouth, you get in trouble. <laughs> And they'll also get people in trouble now for stuff that happened 20 or 30 years ago. That's the new thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, they uh, they really hadn't bothered me on anything I used to do. But uh, Vince loved it. He loved everything I did every time I said something, you know. And all the promoters love it because it drew money. And I can talk about people and say things about people and their family, their heritage and all that. And they say, oh, you can't say that no more. You need to say this. Now, I'll say what I want. If you don't want to hear it, cut it out. Cut it on the floor, it on the floor. flush it down the commode. But I'm going to say what I got to say. And that's the way I feel about it. I try not to use no racial slurs because everybody knows I'm not a racial person. I'm just a nice old country boy trying to make a living and make it to the end. And that's, that's all I'm trying to do. You're very well remembered for that vignette from Tuesday Night Titans where it showed you at your house and you had the rifles and everything. Whose idea was that and what did you think of that whole uh, skit that people still talk about today? Well, you know, Vince uh, took us out to a house and he said, listen, David, this girl is going to be your wife and those two boys are going to be your kids. I want you to go out here and and just say it's your house and this is your wife and kids and just take it from there. Ad -lib it, do whatever you want to do. It has no plan. Just do whatever you want to do. So it just started rolling off and going good. Of course, the, the young man that was there with us, uh, you know, they didn't understand show business and they cried a lot until we got them straight that it was show business and entertainment and that I'm not going to hurt them. I'm not going to do anything. And the girl there, she was scared to death the whole time anyway, but finally she calmed down after we talked and hung around a couple hours together because, you know, at first they was just petrified and, uh, I think they were still petrified, <laughs> but it come off pretty good. It, it was good. I mean, Elsie, Elsie, I never seen Elsie no more. I don't know what happened to her. The cow. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe someone ate her by now. Who knows? That's right. Oh, she's too old to do anything now. So <laughs> yeah. James would like to know uh, if you got along with Andre the Giant. Any memories of him? Oh, yeah, I got along good with him. He was, uh, I think he was, uh, he didn't like me because I would, I would be tight on him all the time, hitting him and everything. And he, he didn't like that, but he never said anything about it. He just, he just laughed it off, you know. Yeah, boss, go ahead, go ahead, boss. You can't hit me too hard, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Let me get a sledgehammer over here and we'll change that. <laughs> When Piper and myself, they told him out of the Madison Square Garden on a stretcher, I think he realized that we could beat him up pretty bad because he didn't like that idea. And I guess Vince called the shot or whatever, wanted him to it out on a stretcher. So I think Piper and myself were the only people who ever beat him and sent him out on a stretcher. So, you know, he didn't like to lose. Uh, you know, I didn't mind losing. People always said, you know, he, I mean, you know, if I'm getting beat, they're not going to use me. So I just will move on, you know. And uh, if I have to let people win, that was the word there, uh, win. I mean, if I have to let them win to get them over, 
Hannibal, I, you know, I don't want to sit there and let them win. If they can beat me, fine. I'll let them win, or they're going to beat me anyway. I, I didn't find many people in there that could beat me. There was a few that could actually uh, beat me uh, if they got a chance. But uh, we had some tough ones back then, too. And come to find out they weren't as tough as they thought they were, you know. What was the uh, the worst shoot that you were in with a professional wrestler in the ring? I know that you told a story last time that you and Hogan got into it in the dressing room once. And another time you beat up some jobber in the dressing room that was rude to you. Is there any other situations where you had to get into it for real with another wrestler? No, Hogan and me never got into it in the dressing room. The fact is, we used to fight each other. We were the best friends, you know, and we used to uh, work all the guys all the time. They thought we were mad all the time at each other. And uh, I know one time they said that, I believe it was Brett that said in his book that we fought each other a shoot for 45 minutes, and finally Hogan beat me. Come on, Hannibal, 45 minutes. Most people never step in the ring or did any boxing, wrestling, or anything else. Can say, oh, my God, it took him a long time, 45 minutes. Let me tell you, I don't know any two guys can go 45 minutes in a shoot and backstage with all the guys watching. We were just having a good time, man. And they said we went 45 minutes in a shoot. And Hogan beat me, of course, they said. I don't remember. I don't recall that at all. But uh, yeah. we used There's to no do way Hogan had that much cardio. Yeah, exactly. Especially me. Hey, 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay, if it ain't a work, if it's a work, I can go the 45. There's no problem. But, uh, you know, if you're playing around, having a good time. But if you're having to protect yourself uh, from getting beat, tied up, wrapped up, sandwich, whatever you want to do, you ain't gonna do it for forty-five minutes, and uh, I don't know anybody that could. I don't even know. I don't even know two professional boxers could go. <laughs> and we didn't have no breaks either. The way he said, forty-five minutes. Yeah, Man. and M M M M A is like five rounds, five five-minute rounds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. I just, uh, I said, wow. I didn't know I was so tough. Forty-five minutes. Dang. I should have got paid extra. And Vince wouldn't have let uh, Hulk Hogan be in that kind of danger, I'm sure, if that happened in WWE. Oh, no, no, no. That was uh, – we used to do it all the time in the dressing room. We'd argue, and finally they put him in a private dressing room. Didn't want him around nobody. And come to think of maybe he didn't want him around me because he did tell him to stay away from me. And uh, I guess he told Hogan one time that – uh, hey, it's either Schultz or me. And from that day forward, Terry never spoke to me again. And I done a lot for this guy. But, you know, it, it wasn't many favor. It's just, you know, he wanted to get in the business. He didn't have the sense enough to get in the business. Didn't have sense enough to do an interview. Didn't have sense good walk around sense. But I helped him. I gave him a place to live at times. And you know, we rode up and down the road together, and but after he took me 45 minutes and won the match, I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, that's typical in wrestling. Most fans don't understand it, but there, I, I wouldn't really say I have hardly any friends that I would consider a real friend in wrestling because everyone will backstab you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got I got scars all in my back, man. And then you get back up to them, you ask them, "What do you say about me?" What is it? Oh no, I didn't say nothing about you. He misunderstood me, and you know, uh, I don't know. A couple of them, I was gonna stick their head in the commode. I had them up, fixed them, put your head in the commode, and flush your commode. And Vince come running back there, and said, "David, put him down." Well, that's a, you know, why? Yo, but him, yeah, get him, put him down. And I, I started to put him right on in the commode because he, he was whining about the match being so tough. And after I put him down, Ben said, Yeah, 
you know, you need to lighten up on these guys. You got all these guys scared of you. I'm not scared of you. I said, well, you're the one that needs to be very, very, very scared of me, Vince. And I don't guess he talked to me no more after that. I mean, Louie wants to know what are your thoughts on Billy Jack Haynes? You might have run into him in Portland. I remember Billy Jack and another guy with him, and they was training then. And Billy Jack at that time, well, he wasn't in the business yet, but he was a pretty nice guy. We worked out in the gym together. and uh, But, you know, he was a nice guy. And uh, then later on, I seen him on the TV wrestling already. And uh, I said, well, as big as he was, they could use him on there. But I heard they really got messed around pretty bad. But, again, I don't know all the facts. But he was a pretty nice guy. Treated me good anyway. Uh, here's a funny question. Somebody wants to know if you saw this Will Smith slapping thing at the Oscars. That is the weakest the whiningest little slap I ever seen in my life. And I'm going to tell you right now, if he can't knock that little skinny boy off his feet, then he needs to get out of the acting and everything else. That's the worst slap I ever seen in my life. I'd still say it was all set up. It all was, that's, that's my opinion of it. Will Smith did not slap that boy with his hand. He might have touched him with his fingertips. And now they're getting money involved, see. But Will Smith, if if that's as tough as he is, he needs to go back home and or go somewhere and learn how to protect himself. And if he's going to slap somebody, slap them. Don't just kind of whine it down. Now, he didn't even knock that boy. Boy he didn't even stagger. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't even, make him, didn't, even think, didn't even make him think about getting hit. Wow. Don't you know Will felt bad about that when he looked back and they didn't show the actual contact yet? I haven't seen the actual contact on the slap yet. Somebody's and supposedly holding. he's going to rehab now. They're setting him to rehab for temper issues and all over a little weak slap. <laughs> yeah, these guys, man, I tell you, it's pathetic what people have to go through with, you know. And, and you know, in my bounty hunting days, I'd go down to New York City in the Bronx and uh, all hell, kitchen, all that down through there. And two o'clock in the morning, be by myself and drag these guys out of the building. They're not as tough as they think they are. They might want people to think they're tough, but no, they're not that tough. I guarantee you. And when I had to slap one, if I had to slap one, I guarantee you went off his feet. But, uh, you know. Most of them just jumped down on the ground and hollered, please don't hit me. <laughs> that was a joke. I didn't hit nobody. I'm a nice guy. I don't know that. Yeah. You wouldn't have lasted this long if you uh, assaulted the people that you captured. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. If you, that's what I tell people. I say, I never had a problem with anybody. I mean, I'd pick people up that, uh, I mean, murders, rapists, all this. And I mean, you know, bank robbers, I've actually picked up all these kind of people. And I've picked up people that raped three-year-old kid or said they raped three-year-old kid. That's what they was out on, on bond for. And, you know, I want to push him out of the car going down the road. But I don't know that that to be the fact because he hadn't went to court yet. So I tell you, hey, all I'm doing is bringing you in where you can go to court on your day. I don't want you to miss no more court dates. And... You know, I've had them to have guns on them. They, I never give them a chance to pull them. I always take it off of them. But uh, knives, uh, I mean, it's a very dangerous situation now. Sunview would like to know your memories of wrestling Antonio Inoki. I think that might have been the same night you did the slap. Yeah, Antonio Inoki, he was... Uh, he was, uh, you know, what the thing I heard in Madison Square Garden, that Antonio Noki paid me that night. That's what Vince said, that he paid me that night. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that, but Antonio Noki, I went to Japan, and he wanted me to let him win. And I said, no, that's not going to happen. And 
He said, oh, you know, uh, no work or anything? Uh, this him? Nope. He said, uh, well, you know, you're not putting me over? Nope. Beat me if you can. And we had a hell of a match. Because, you know, even if you're disagreeing on who's going to win or whatever, you don't mess it up when you're in front of, when you're in front of thousands and thousands of people in one of those big sports arenas. And Antonio Noki is out there and we're having a, a hell of a match. But he knew that I had him two or three times. You know what I'm talking about. People won't know that. But, you know, when you get hooked, you know you're hooked. And don't take but a minute, slide your hand out. You're not hooked anymore. But you realize you're done. And then you continue to match on without messing up the match. You know, it's business, entertainment. You don't go out there and mess the match up. But you can send the signal to them. Hey, I got you, man. Boom. Yep, you sure do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we had good matches. And he understood where I was coming from. And, uh, you know. You also tag teamed with uh, Macho Man Randy Savage in the Maritimes. What did you okay. think about uh, him over the years? Well, uh, Macho Man, he was a good tag team partner, and I'd known him for years when he used to go to the matches and challenge uh, everybody out of the ring, Jerry Lawler, George Goulas, all these, because they wouldn't book him, so he'd go to the shows, and he'd come outside of the ring and challenge all of them. And I told him, Randy, just don't challenge me, man. You know, we're pretty good friends, but don't challenge me because I'd have to take it up on it. Oh, no, no, I'm not trying. I ain't trying you, no. You know what this is all about. Yep, okay. Challenge all you want then. And poor George Goulas, you know, he challenged him. Who in the hell wants to challenge George Goulas? I mean, give me a break. You know, he did it. He did it all over Memphis, everywhere. And then all of a sudden, he gets uh, Memphis with partners. And then uh, Vince gets rid of me and brings him in, which is a good break for him. I'm glad he got the break, you know. He worked hard. And, you know, he, he deserved a break. What did you think of his brother, Lanny? Lanny, I like Lanny. I got along with Lanny real good. Uh, never hung around with him too much. But just in the in the dressing rooms and all, you know, in the matches that we had, he was always a always a nice guy. Never no problem with Lanny at all, man. Now you lived your life very straight and narrow, but you worked with Roddy Piper a lot. How did you guys get along? Well, I thought we got along real good, but uh, I don't know. I think he uh, I think he he did a lot of backstabbing. He didn't want nobody to get over him. And he wanted to get all the heat and tag team matches. He wanted to do all the heat getting, you know. And uh, But we got along good. We survived. We went through. I uh, never had no really cross words about anything. Face to face, we had. But I'm sure my ears were burning a lot when he was talking with Vince and different ones. But that happens a lot anyway. <laughs> I got a earache a lot of times. <laughs> Must be the wind. Down south, you know, the wind is pretty strong. Gives you a earache. And my wife said, well, clean your ears. That ain't it. You don't understand. <laughs> you know, my wife, the other day, let me tell you, I got to tell you, I was fixing to head up here for these. Uh, I've been up here about a week. And I said, I'm going to have to put some more air in the tires because the book's in the back of the truck is overweighting it. And when I get overweight and I got to put air in the tire, she said, so you're telling me if I go with you, you're going to have to air the tires up. I said, no, baby, I ain't going to have no tires. I'll just put an extra wide load line on you. <laughs> I didn't get nothing to eat for three days after that one. <laughs> you, you've been married a really long time for a wrestler, especially. Uh, what 54 is it? Years. 54 years. Wow. That's incredible. Went to junior high school. Went to junior high school with her. And let me tell you, I told her, I said, I wouldn't take a million dollars for you, baby. I wouldn't take a million dollars for you. But I wouldn't give 10 cents for three more just like you. I didn't eat for a week after that either. She didn't understand. 
I, when I lost so much weight, you know, she she's always telling me, yeah, have that little girl down at the hamburger place fix you a hamburger. You want a hamburger? <laughs> now, she's a good girl, let me tell you. Great, 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 great woman. I just, I just aggravate her when I can, try to make her laugh, you know. And uh, she said, I've heard all your jokes. I'm not laughing at them. And I'll tell her a good one pull it right out of the air and she'll laugh. And it just makes me feel good that I can still make her laugh. You know? <laughs> well, I'm glad to know that you're still with her. As far as the honky tonk man, you knew him from the very beginning. Uh, what are your thoughts on yeah. him? Well, I always thought Wayne was a pretty good boy. But then all of a sudden he makes this accusation that I told him I was going to drop a mortar round in on Vince's house and kill everybody, everybody there. Everybody in the family killed everybody in, the, in the everybody. And I said, now how can he say he said that and he ain't talked to me since he's been with Vince? He hadn't seen me since that. He hadn't seen me since Calgary. And I'm the one that got him into Calgary talking up for him. And uh, I said, I don't know why he would say that. And I said, I don't have the ability to get a hold of mortar rounds, but might check around and find some C4 or something. <laughs> I said, that's a joke. That's a joke. I don't have no C4. Just heard the word. Uh, there's a fan on here that wants to know which promoter was your favorite to work for. Did you have a favorite territory? Yeah, it's too hard. Stu Hart was great. Uh, he was he was he was one of the best promoters that I ever worked for. Long time period. There's a lot of there's a lot of little promoters now that's doing little shows here and there and there, and they're pretty good promoters, but they don't know what they're doing. Half of them. And the boys in the ring today are not being taught the. They're taught entertainment. Take a bump, fly, do this, do that, do that. It don't, and I, I asked him, why do y'all do all that? Why? I mean, you just kicked that guy 27 times in the left side, and now you're beating him in the head with a fist. Uh, he said, well, we got to keep going. No, no, no. You need to get some more training somewhere, you know. But they're trying, though. They try, and they put on a good show. That I got to say, most of the small-time wrestling organization – put on a great show as for what they got, you know, and, you know, I, I enjoy watching uh, to a certain point. I usually don't sit around for the main event, but just because I have to go somewhere. <laughs> Is there somebody watching TV in there? Who's that? Is there somebody in your room watching TV? Because the sound of the yeah. TV did you ask yeah, you know, know who it is. You oh, know, you know who it is. I ain't gonna tell you. <laughs> yeah, he's watching. I love Lucy. I didn't know he liked yeah, that. That's hilarious. There's a fan out here yeah, that wants to know uh, your thoughts on Dino Bravo. Dino Bravo. We never had much contact, so I can't talk. Uh, I can't. I can't talk about him because we never was together. Never each other we'd pass each other and dress them in the hallway or something but that would be it you know yeah it's unfortunate about what happened to him uh, i guess he was murdered yep i heard that yep james is That's wondering not hard you, no yeah he got into some trouble i guess hard to do. Yeah. yeah that no that's not hard to do up around new york and that area just all you got to do is mess the wrong man around and it's all over. And, you know, you don't mess them around, man. You, you, you know, they're humans like us. They do their business. They want to, they want to, they want to do their bit. They want to do their thing. Let them do it. It has nothing to do with me or you or anybody. Let them do it. And just, you know, don't talk about them and don't make accusations about them because they'll get you. That's true. James would like to know your thoughts about working for Vern Gagne, where you had a great run with the AWA. Yep. Vern Gagne was a heck of a promoter. He was a good guy, tough guy, and uh, he always treated me great. Man. 
until Vince told me to go in one morning and tell him I quit. Well, that didn't go over too good because Hogan had already went to Vince and never told Vern that he was going up there. And Vern didn't know he had, he had accepted uh, Vince's offer and went up there. So my interviews on Hogan was Vern was said, why is he saying that? Uh, you know, I said, he's not going to show up. He, he's a coward. He's yellow. And if he does show up, I'll take his tights off of him, his boots and everything else, and cut his hair bald, Eddie, and send him out in the street. And Vern, why is he saying all that? <laughs> but he didn't, Hogan didn't do him right. He, sh he should have at least, uh, you know, told him what's happening. And But Vern is a, Vern was a tough guy, man. He he went through the bit. He, he was, he was so, and good promoter. He, like I said, he took care of me, and I, I have nothing bad to say about it. There's a fan on here that just wanted to say, he says, you're the best still from the old Stampede Wrestling. Uh, he doesn't, uh, he didn't have a dad growing up, so you taught him a lot. Thank you. That's great. You're welcome. Father, of, hey, just, just listen to what I tell you if i tell you a, push, a rooster or a box car you hook him up that's all you got to do just hook him up andy would like to know uh, what was the iron chic like backstage oh he was okay he was uh you know he listened to him running his mouth and everything but uh he was okay he didn't mean nothing by it. he just couldn't talk perfect english so you know, but uh, Cosgro, he was he was a good guy. I mean, to me, he was anyway. We were, we made a few trips together, and uh, you know, if I could keep the pipe out of his mouth, I would be. He smoked that old tobacco in a pipe, you know. And uh, I told him that stuff's got to go, man. And but he's a good guy. Do you have any advice for being a heel? I know the wrestling business is a lot different now, and you almost get in trouble and shunned from the business if you act like a real heel but maybe you could still give your advice on how to be a good heel for any of the young wrestlers that might be watching well you know the best thing to do like herb wells told me when he was training me don't go outside and talk to the young fans there and sign their autograph and hug up all these little girls with your arms around all this because if they see you doing that they're going to say he's not that bad a guy he's over there those kids and everything. That's the reason I went in one door and out the other. I, I got out the quickest way I knew how. I'd leave the arena sometime. They wouldn't even know I was gone because I didn't like to talk to the fans afterwards. I loved the fans, but I didn't want to talk to them because you start talking to one, here's two, four, five, 20, 30 of them there. And they'll look over there and see you talking to them people. So I had to run them off. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd had to uh, split the crowd up and get my car set on fire and get my tires cut. And my windows broke out, so had to keep my image up, you know. There's another fan that wants to know, did you have a favorite opponent over the years, somebody that you like to be in the ring with? Uh, most of the guys was okay. I like, I like being in a ring with them. But, you know, you're just as good as the guy you're with. I mean, it, uh, you know, that was a lot of them just so easy, easy to work with and have a match with. And, uh, you know, and then there's some that come out there and you have to work hard. Man. I mean, you have to work. You have to uh, take the reins and do the whole thing, everything, every time. Can't turn them loose. They'll blow it wide open. You turn them loose. <laughs> Hey, no, you need to get back in the ring, boy. Don't make me come out there. <laughs> oh, I thought we was finished, you know. I notice uh, a lot of wrestlers today, if they're booked against a guy that they don't like, they'll publicly ask to be taken out of the match. My philosophy, if I'm booked against someone I don't like, is just beat them up in the ring. What are your thoughts That's on right. that? That's right. You. Right. That's absolutely right. And uh, people wouldn't let it know. I had a bunch of people didn't want to get in the ring with me. They 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 tell them they say, "You you're working with David Show, Doctor D today." And uh, guys say, "Oh, I got to go home, man. My wife just called. She's sick." 
she says she's going to deliver it. She's having a baby or something, anything. They make up all kind of excuses. And, uh, you know, I, I, I never, I, people just didn't want to work, you know. They didn't want to go out there and work and uh, do what you're supposed to do. Make the fans have a good time, enjoy themselves. Well, when they go home and they go to work the next day, they still talk about you. Dr. D, you ought to see him, man. He beat the hell out of two or three people, man. He did this, he did that. They didn't go out there and say, oh, Dr. D, whatever. He was asleep half the time. But uh, I tried to give them exactly what they wanted, a lot of excitement. They pay a lot of money, and they need to be entertained. Someone wants to know, where does the name Schultz come from? Are you German background? What's your uh, ethnic background? My ethnic background? Oh, I got a little German and uh, I guess a little bit of Tennessee hillbilly and uh, uh, Scandinavian and uh, uh, I don't know. I never, I never been asked that question. I better put my hat back on. You may, <laughs> you may think I'm from Australia somewhere. <laughs> But Travis wants I, to know I, if you have any stories from wrestling in Detroit. No, I, I worked there a few times, but it's it's not memorable that I was there, you know. And um, I believe that was the Sheik territory or uh, whoever. I, uh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't find myself going back too many times because, you know, yeah, I heard the, the guy was there. He's, the guys that are on top of these territories, they don't want you around because you make it hard for them to maintain their image. And, uh, you know, but I enjoyed that to do that, you know. And uh, I'm going to have to get me a new hat. I'm going to tell you that right now. I don't know. I think somebody sat on my hat. Uh, I was on the train the other day. I think some fat lady sat on it and it kind of flattened it out, you know. But it was probably the captain, the guy that you're in the room yeah. with right now. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I wish they'd stay off my hat, I'll tell you. From oh, your yeah. bounty hunting oh, experience, yeah. uh, where would you say is the most dangerous city that you've had to go for bounty hunting? Um, probably New York. Uh, I had to go to uh, Cairo, Egypt and get a guy, and San Domingo is pretty tough, and Puerto Rico is pretty tough, but uh, the cities, uh, New York is probably the tough, Bridgeport, Connecticut is pretty tough too. They, uh, you know, they'll get big bricks and throw them off the buildings on, onto the police when they come up, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you don't have too much trouble down south, you know, they, you uh, they go to their brother's house, their cousin's house, something like that. But New York, man, they hit the trail. They California, they go to Texas, they go to Santa Domingo, Puerto Rico, and you got to find them and go get them and get them out of there, out of their country. And that's, they don't like to, you know, have people come to their country and take them out. I didn't care what they didn't like. I had to get the guy back home. My baby needed a new pair of shoes, so. <laughs> Is there any reason why you never worked extensively in Texas? Do what now? Is there any reason why you never worked like really extensively in the Texas territories? Because that was a big area uh, around the time you were in your prime, but it didn't seem like you ever really worked the Von Erichs territory or Houston too much. No, I never had the opportunity because he never called me and made me an offer. Uh, you know, they just like uh, uh, Florida, uh, Grams and all. They never, uh, they had too many guys that wanted to be on top. And when they talked it over with them, oh, no, don't bring him in here. That, you know, I'm sure that's that's probably what happened. But the Von Erickson, I just never got the opportunity. I worked at uh, Louisiana a little bit, Bill Watts and Grizzly Smith and all. And uh, that was a, uh, that was a, uh, I experienced down there for about a couple months, and it just seemed like uh, they didn't want me down. You can tell when you're not wanted, you know. They, you're getting over too good. It's making them work harder, 
and I just got to go, you know. You know who knows when they're not wanted? That's you, Hannibal. All kinds of slander today. I would not sit on Dr. D's hat. And number two, and most importantly, you said back when he was in his prime. This easy, man bro. is still in his prime. And you oh, know what? Well, maybe still be you up, that's for sure. Maybe we'll come and hunt your Did ass down. Adios, Hannibal. Oh. What? Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please help me out and like this video, then click the subscribe and get notifications buttons so you don't miss any of my latest